Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Costume Cinematographico and my first Q&A. Thanks to everyone who submitted a question in the comment section. And as the channel grows, I hope to upload more often and get to many more of your requests that you've been leaving for me. So before we get to the questions, I wanted to share with you some sketches from one of my viewers. Her name is Tatiana Melendez. And I love how Tatiana has incorporated the unique stylings of both Marjorie Tyrell, Cersei Lannister, and they're both, of course, from um, Game of Thrones, and Mary Queen of Scots on the right, which is from Rain. And she tells me in a quick little bio, she says, I'm 24 years old, I'm from Puerto Rico, but I'm currently living in England on an exchange program. Back home, I'm a drama major, but for the program, I'm studying Hispanics, which is ironic since PR is a Spanish-speaking country, but that's a, but that's a bit of a long story. And she says she loves anything pertaining to the performing arts, such as acting, singing, designing costumes, and like Fred Astaire, she even dances a little. I thought that would be a great idea if you're into costume design or into cosplaying, perhaps you'd love to send me or like to send me a costume sketch or a cosplay costume or any other costume ideas that you want to share with your, my viewers. Um, you can do so by emailing them to me and what I'll do is I'll leave my email in the description below and what I'll do is I'll feature it in an upcoming video. So to start, I'm going to go to the questions. And my very first question is from Robert Furlong. He's been uh, one of my uh, viewers since the very beginning. So I thank Robert so much for that. And his question is, my question for the Q&A is, how did you become so knowledgeable? What background do you have? OK, so um, I think I probably have mentioned this before that I've worked in theater. I went to theater school in Toronto, went to Ryerson Polytechnic University and study technical theater. And then from there, when I graduated, I started working in theater and film, but mostly in theater as either a wardrobe head or a buyer or an assistant. And then I also worked in, in film, doing mostly background players, um, but I also worked in the wardrobe as well, helping to organize the stock. And then after that, I opened up my own costume business where I did custom-made costumes and I also was open to the general public. So I would sell specific costume items uh, during Halloween and so on. And I did that for about 10 years. So I hope that answers your question. And um, if you have any further questions, you guys are, can feel free to ask me in the comments. My next question comes from Miss Abby 101, who is obviously a Game of Thrones fan by her picture. And she asks, what are your all time least favorite and favorite costumes from any movie or TV show? And when I first saw this question, I thought, oh my gosh, this is so hard. But what I've come up with, um, I mean, I'm just giving you a few examples because um, I have so many costumes that I love. But one of my most favorite films is actually uh, Angels and Insects, and I adore the costumes. Um, that movie goes back, it's back uh, in 1995 that I saw it. And the costumes were designed and created by Paul Brown, who works in both theater and film. And it's like a Victorian style, but he's done a real sort of play on it with the angels and insects. He's actually incorporated that into the design and it's just gorgeous. So if you ever have a chance to see it, and if you're a Game of Thrones fan, I think you'll probably also enjoy it for, uh, I won't give you any spoilers though. And the other film that I love the design for, I love the costumes for is Wings of a Dove. It's uh, from 1995 and it's based on a Henry James novel. And the design was done by Sandy Powell, who is a very famous costume designer. She's won three Oscars for Shakespeare in Love, The Aviator, and The Young Victoria. You might have seen one of them. And I just love the palette of the show. I love the, the, the style of the costumes of that era. It's just stunning and gorgeous. So again, uh, a wonderful film. If you're into costumes, I would recommend, highly recommend checking it out. Now, in terms of my least favorite costume, I'd have to say, hands down, my least favorite costume is Harley Quinn from Suicide Squad. So it's not just that um, I don't like the design, I don't like the look of it, it's also that I find it really sexist. And first of all, you know, she's very scandally dressed, which isn't always a bad thing. I mean, there's lots of costumes that I like that are like that. But in this case, um, she's dressed this way while all of her male counterparts are completely dressed, fully dressed head to toe. 
But the thing that I find the most egregious about this is this design is that her jacket on the back says property of Joker, denoting that she is a piece of owned property. And just to top it off, on her crotch, it's tattooed lucky you. So it's just, I mean, I guess they were trying to go for trash. Um, it just, it sort of caps off a, what I think is a really terrible movie and a, a really terrible costume. And I, you know, I love Kate Hawley, who was the costume designer on it. I mean, you know how I felt about um, her other movies that she's done. So it's just a shame. But there it is. My next question from the Q&A comes from I Don't Want a Channel, which I, by the way, I love that name. They ask, what does that black round giant button looking thing that Dark Sansa wears in her raven dress? I think they mean, like, what does it mean? And uh, I thought I had actually addressed this in the Sansa video, but when I went and looked back, I actually hadn't. So here we go. The object itself appears to be a round slide buckle uh, made from metal, bone, or plastic like these ones seen here. And slide buckles are used for woven belts and bags. So here's an example of what that looks like. Now into the greater meaning behind it. I think this is what you're asking more about. I can find two possible explanations. The first one is not that terribly exciting. So Michelle Clapton, she appears to be enjoy wearing these round objects around her neck. I've noticed them in several interviews with her, several presentations and photos of her. She's always got something like this around her neck. And, and they're usually held into position with a weighted chain. So it's possible that she just loves them so much that she decided to give Sansa one of her own. Um, and in the interview, she rarely ever speaks of the this, of this circle. She just usually talks about needle, which is the sort of the, the pendant at the end or the weight at the end. So she talks more about the significance of that and not so much about the circle. So this is why I'm wondering if there really is any additional meaning to it. But then I looked a little further into it. So this is what I came up with. The other possible explanation, one that I discovered through a form is a little bit more symbolic. So some of the fans of the show believe that the jewelry piece might be might represent the moon door located in the high hall of the Erie, and it's a hatch built into the floor through which people can fall to their deaths. My thought were that my thoughts were that it might be based upon a symbol that we see throughout the series, like this formation of dead horses left in a spiral formation. And I've mentioned this before, it's called a, a Revakek or Arminian Wheel of Eternity. And we actually saw that emblem or that design on one of Danny's dresses. We see similar symbols with the circle and cross. So like on the left is another formation of bodies left by the White Walkers. And that actually was from the Game of Thrones debut. And on the right, a Dothraki funeral pyre, the one that Danny survives unburnt. So showrunner Steve and Dan had something to say about this. And they said that the symbols were intentional, that these an ancient symbols were used by the White Walkers and they lead back to the symbols used by the children of the forest around the weirwood tree. And like the spiral symbols, the circle line symbol is a masculine or feminine element depending on its direction. So the symbol on the left here with the horizontal line indicates the passive female element and what has been there since the beginning of time and all things, while the symbol on the right with a vertical bar represents the active male element, indicating what comes from on high and the effective element in time. So where does this leave us with Sansa's pendant? So it's not certain because her pendant is wonky and it doesn't necessarily sit in one direction or another. So we might take some hint from Michelle Clapton's original sketch, which shows that the bar is definitely vertical, indicating a, an active male element. And this would certainly make sense since Sansa changes into Dark Sansa, attempting to take charge of her destiny. So anyway, let me know what your thoughts are. You can leave it below in the comments section. I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. So our next question is from Nellie Toivonen. Sorry, Nellie, I hope I said that correctly. Toivonen. Thank you for yet another great video. For the Q&A, could you please compare the different regional styles within the Game of Thrones universe? Like, how's King's Landing dif how King's Landing differs from the North and perhaps some analysis of Slaver's Bay and Dothraki styles. So 
After looking at this question, I realized it's extremely complicated, and I didn't think I would be able to answer this in a succinct way in this Q&A. So what I'm going to do, Nellie, is I'm actually going to do dedicate an entire video to this, uh, probably coming in the next few weeks, because it's such an enormous um, thing, and I was already starting to do some information on it, and it's actually very interesting. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do a dedicated video to that. So I hope that's okay for now. Next question comes from, I think it's Yusu. Yuisu, is there anything you would have done differently or were disappointed with regarding to the costumes in Game of Thrones? Do you generally have a favorite historical era or specific culture that you like costumes from? Okay, so I'm going to just, I'll answer the first question. So while I can appreciate the craftsmanship, my least favorite are the costumes of Dorne. And it's particularly difficult because I never really felt that invested in any of the characters with the exception of Oberon. And so, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a costume video about this as well in the coming weeks. So perhaps I might change my mind about it, but for now that's kind of my least favorite grouping of costumes from Game of Thrones. Now to answer the second part of your question, um, I've got a couple of periods that I really love or eras. And one of my favorite costume periods is probably the Empire and Regency periods between about 17, the late 1700s and early 1800s. And this is, um, you know, is a time period of Jane Austen in England. She's one of my favorite authors. So it makes it really easy for me to love that. And I've pretty much have seen every adaptation that BBC have done of her books. Uh, I've read all of her books. And in this particular case, this is uh, from the movie Becoming Jane, starring J um, Anne Hathaway. And I, and in this period, why well, I think I like it so much, it's not just the women's costumes that I adore. I love the men's costumes as well. They're just stunning and gorgeous. I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of this era. Um, so here is an example of an American Empire waistline gown from about 1810 that's made from cotton and silk, and it's on display at the Met in New York. And I guess what I love so much about it is just this period, everything is so simple and elegant and oftentimes it's done in very, very light colors like acru and white and cream. It's just so simple. And what they say on the Met website is that the Empire silhouette is readily identified with its origins in the Chiton or ancient Greco-Romans, which was a tubular garment draped from the shoulders and sometimes belted under the bust. So I also love Greco-Roman clothing so that's probably another reason why I like this era so much. Here's another example. This is a French Empire waistline gown from 1804 and it's made from cotton. So this is another thing. They used to just use these really natural simple fabrics and uh, like lawn and cotton and very like lightweight muslins to make the gowns. Very very fresh, very simple. And again on the mat it says, as the style progressed, the skirts began to flatten at the front and slowly gather from the bodice at the center back. And the style persisted until the 1820s when the waist slowly lowered and the skirts became more bell-shaped. This, I just had to show you this because I think it's just stunning. Um, the fabric on this is actually very contemporary. You could wear this today. And it's a British evening gown from about 1797 to 99, and it's made from silk linen. And again, it's on display at the Met. If any of you live in New York, by the way, you should definitely go to the Met. It's like one of the most amazing collections of costume and historical clothing in the world. And my other favorite period, just to add as well, is the 1930s. And like the 1800s, it again has this Grecian silhouette, which I love so much. So I've got a couple of samples here. On the left, like, I mean, this is so Hollywood looking, this 1931 Chanel sequin evening gown. And it was designed by Gabrielle Coco Chanel, of course. And it was worn by Gloria Swanson, who, of course, was a big film star at that time. And uh, it's, on, it's on display at the Museum of Costume and Lace. And the one on the right is Madeline Vionette, who, you know, I've talked about before. I adore her clothes. It's from 1938, and it's a silk gown, and it's on display at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Again, another great place to check out uh, historical costumes if you ever have a chance to go there. Here's a gown. Oh my gosh, it's so exquisite. This one is another Madeline Vionette gown. Uh, she's known for her bias cut gowns I had mentioned in a previous video. And this one dates from 1936. It's um, Madame Madeleine Vionette was French, so it's from France. And again, it's on display at the Victorian Albert Museum. So for the next question, I have uh, Professor 
Cecily Cogsworth. And she asks, what tutorials would you recommend for medieval embroidery? And it's a really wonderful question. And for this, I turn to the Society for Creative Anachronism. They're an international living history group with the aim of studying and recreating mainly medieval European cultures and their histories before the 17th century. So before I kind of give you the information on that, I'm just going to break down quickly what is medieval embroidery. So to start, one of the most famous uh, types of medieval embroidery is called gold work. And it's embroidery that uses gold metallic threads, although it is still considered gold work, even if the threads are imitation gold, silver, and copper. And gold work reached its pinnacle during the Middle Middle Ages and was called opus aglicanum. I'm sorry if I say that incorrectly, but my Latin is terrible. So here are two examples of medieval gold work. So on the left is a chasuble with the badges of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon executed in gold work from the mid 16th century. And some of these uh, samples that we have here, you know, they're, they're like they're 500 years old. They're in amazing condition. Luckily, we still have them. And on the right, I just love this little purse. It's an alms purse dated in the middle of the 14th century with three brocaded tablet woven bands. It's just so sweet. We also have ornui or shaded gold, which is what it means. And this is a gold work technique involving couching golded threads with colored threads to, to produce a painted like picture with a gleaming gold foundation. This is an extremely famous example. It's a detail of a mantle of the vestments of the Order of the Golden Fleece, and it's on display at the Treasury in Hofburg, Vienna. Opus Teutonicum, or Dutch work, is a style of white work embroidery created by using white linen thread on a white linen background. Popular during the medieval period in various parts of Europe, here are two examples of white work embroidery. So on the left, we've got the lectern hanging from Westphalia, and that's from the late 14th century. And on the right is a figure from the hanging of the Kloster Loon from the 13th century. Here's some black work embroidery. This is something that we see a lot of, like even on like uh, Elizabeth I, you'll see a lot of this type of work on her gowns. And it's a form of embroidery, generally using black silk thread on white or an off-white linen or cotton background. And sometimes the metallic threads or colored threads are used for accents as seen in this blackwork coif from the V&A Museum with gold and braid work. Voided work refers to a type of embroidery where the pattern is created by leaving the design unstitched and only stitching the background in one color. So here's an example. It's a fragment of voided work border I'm not sure what that means. And it's from Italy and it's from the 16th century. And I thought I'd throw this little piece of European embroidery in. It's actually on display at the Textile Museum of Canada in Toronto, where I live. And it's from, it's really sweet. It's from the 17th, the late 17th to early 18th century. And this chunkier embroidery, it's more homespun looking, is made of wool yarn on a linen ground fabric. A great resource I found is the Keepers of Athena Thimble or the Embroiderers Guild of the East Kingdom of the Society for Creative Anachronisms, Inc. That's a mouthful. And it's run by Mistress Briny of Chatham. She's the guild mistress and she offers a series on medieval embroidery on YouTube. So just to make things easier, I've created a playlist for you on my channel and I'll provide all the links below. And you can also look for your local chapter local kingdom it's called at the society for creative anachronisms incorporated for more information another very informative website is the historical needlework resources website it's not much to look at but it has a lot of information on needlework embroidery and its techniques from the 7th to the 16th century the next question comes from i hope i'm saying this correctly Fibustus tours Uh, It says, I have a question for the Q&A. Maybe it sounds strange. Is there a character in particular you'd like to cosplay? Unless you've already done it, laugh out loud. Anyway, great job. Please go on. So my answer to this is, you know, if I was to cosplay, I don't actually cosplay, but if I was going to, 
it would probably be anything uh, that Tilda Swinton was. So pretty much. Um, for example, here's a picture of her as Eve in Jim Jarmusch's Only Lovers Left Alive. It's a fantastic movie about vampires. The next one is Jadis the White Witch in the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion Witch in the Wardrobe, designed by Isis Missenden. Another one is Madame D in the Grand Budapest Hotel. The amazingly brilliant costume designer Milena Cannonero won her first fourth Oscar in costume design for that movie. And also Minister Mason in Snowpiercer. If you haven't seen Snowpiercer, it's so fantastic. You have to catch it. And finally, um, she plays actually a male and a female role. Because uh, so there's a bit of a cross-dressing going on here in Virginia Woolf's adaptation of Orlando. And Sandy Powell, actually, she designed the costumes. She's the same designer from Wings of a Dove. And she was nominated for an Oscar and a BAFTA for Best Costume Design for that. Next question is from Catherine Martin. Love the video. In regards to your Q&A, I'd love to know what sort of costumes you like and if you have a preference for a certain kind of technique or style used in the creation of costumes. So this is a really great question. Um, so for me personally, um, there's two types of ways to sort of make a costume. You can either do it with draping or you can do it with flat pattern drafting. And so what happened to me while I was in theater school, I attempted to do flat pattern drafting and I, I have a problem with numbers or something. So I was really, really bad at it. I'm kind of more of a visual learner. And so I just found I just did a lot better with draping uh, dresses on a, on a dummy than I did with drafting. And, you know, there's two designers who, of course, I admire greatly that are amazing at this. One is Fortuny and the other one is Madame Grace. And um, if you look on Pinterest, you'll find lots of pictures of this type of thing and on the Met as well, the Met's website as well. So not unlike the fashion industry, in a nutshell, pattern drafting is done by creating a custom flat pattern from a block or sloper from the actor's measurements and then manipulating the darts into other darts, tucks and seams or gathers. So the pattern is then cut in muslin and machine basted as a mock-up or twelve for the purpose of fitting. And the muslin is sometimes called factory cotton and it is used because it's inexpensive and it's light colored for markings. And I also like using factory cotton as opposed to other fabrics because it allows you to imagine the final garment without getting distracted. So one time, for instance, we did a fitting for a wedding gown for a play and they had used sort of like this mustardy brown color and it just was really distracting. So that's why I prefer to stick with these lighter color muslin fabrics. And then after the fitting's done, the adjustments are made to the pattern and the pattern is then cut from the final fabric. And once the cutter has a pattern, multiple garments can be made. Draping can be done in either factory cotton or in the final fabric. So here we have an example of where it's being done in factory cotton. Most often, the draper will place the muslin directly on the dressmaker's form and pin and mark the muslin, and then they'll remove the drape pattern from the form and true it up before transferring it to a flat pattern. The other way is you can also just, you know, take the fabric directly and apply it to the dressmaker's dummy with the final fabric. And here's two examples. On the right, by the way, this is a, a picture of, uh, of a draping technique done at Zach Posen's studio, the Hocature designer. Here's an advanced form of draping. It's more accurately called moulage, and where they drape the fabric, the final fabric, directly on the body form. Okay, so the next question is from Alana Favors. She asks, with all the beautiful costume designs you see uh, and go through, uh, do you ever consider making a replica or designing your own? And um, so I'm going to have to say that if I was to make one, I haven't made a costume for quite a while because I have young children, but it would probably be, uh, again, another Tilda Swinton costume. It's the Doctor Strange or ancient one uh, from Marvel's Doctor Strange. And it's, it's just a stunningly gorgeous one. I saw this movie recently. I love the entire film, but her costume, just this particular one stood out to me like amazingly it has what look like sort of origami type folds very japanese looking and it's designed by alexander byrne who is the same designer from elizabeth the golden age and she won a an oscar for that 
And she's also designed other uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe costumes, including Thor, The Avengers, and Guardians of the Galaxy. And anyway, um, regarding Doctor Strange, I plan on doing a video regarding the costumes of Doctor Strange because they're so fantastic. My next question comes from China Death Crash, and she asks, I work a lot making distress costumes. In your Q&A, could you please tell me your favorite distress costumes and maybe some useful techniques for distressing costumes? Um, there's lots of ways you can distress costumes. One of my favorite ways, like I pretty much do this all the time, when I'm working in a sh on a show, is tea dyeing. And I mean, the thing with t what's great about tea dyeing is that it just immediately gives a little bit of an age to a costume without doing too much distressing. So, and you can leave it in the tea bath, you know, for as little as long as you want. So just enough to take out the white, or you can leave it in longer. And then if you find that you've over teed it, you can always bleach it back a bit. So really great use of it. The other one is dipping. And dipping is actually, you can dip something in a tea bath, but you can also dip it in a dye bath. So here's an example of where they've just sort of stuck it in the bath and then the, the fabric slowly sucks it up. And it just gives, like, you know, so for instance, if you wanted the hem to look very, very dark, you could use this technique. And this is another example of where they're doing both dipping and painting. So this could have been put into a tea bath. This is like a a crochet lace or machine lace and they've put it into a bath of dye or tea and then after where they've actually gone with the darker colors and just sort of added it on the edges to give it a bit more of a distress look. Another way of distressing a costume is with paint. In this case they probably have used acrylic paint. Um, they've used it along the seams just to give it a bit of more of an aged thing. This isn't going to look good you know in this type of lighting but with the bright lighting this is going to look really really awesome. So a show like The 100 for instance, a show I've mentioned before, they do this technique, they break down the seams and um, it's actually become sort of part of the the look of the show, the way that they've done this. Another way is um, is by distressing is using certain tools and I mean a lot of people like doing this with their denim but you can use it pretty much on any fabric and so here's some examples using a razor, a cheese grater, sandpaper and scissors and tweezers um, just to pull out the threads or to make the threads, uh, the threads frayed or rough looking or just make the fabric look rough looking. Also on denim, but you can use this as well. I've used uh, Dremel many times. You use a Dremel tool. You can use this on cuffs or on hems or on seams just to give it a little bit more of a distressed look. And the great thing about the Dremel is it has different um, uh, tool bits that you can you know, use depending on how much or how little you want to distress the costume. Next, I mean, you have, okay, this one you have to be a little bit careful of, um, depending on how much or how little you want to distress. But if you really want to go for broke and super duper distress something, bleach is really, really good. Just have to be a little bit careful with it because it will eventually eat holes in the fabric if you leave it on and don't rinse it out. And so what I found is if you want to use bleach, but then you want to get to the point where you want to stop the, uh, the distressing, because bleach is caustic and it will eat through the clothing, you can neutralize it by using hydrogen peroxide dil diluted with some water, so just as a suggestion. But it's really great, obviously, this looks fantastic. Here's another example of distressing where you just take uh, a seam ripper or some scissors and you basically um, distress the jacket by ripping open the lining and having it kind of come away from it. And that'll just automatically give it an aged look. They've also, um, They've also sort of frayed the, the cuffs on the jacket a little bit and also the, the, flap, the, the flaps of the pocket so, and the collar. So that's done it. And also like you can do things like adding darns, like, you know, look, look, little bits of mending. You can add patches, which can sometimes be a little bit goofy looking depending on what you're trying to do. You don't want it to look necessarily like a scarecrow, but you can do strategic patches. And the thing I like really doing a lot is if you put uh, rocks in the pockets and then spray it with water, it'll just kind of make the whole jacket sag down and just look really kind of misshapen. Another way, of course, to distress is to add dirt and uh, lots of shows, as we know, um, 
do this type of technique. And I've mentioned this before, you can use like Fuller's Earth, which is type of um, uh, powder that's actually a natural mineral that's been ground up and you can rub it into clothing. You can, uh, you can wet it and put it on with a sponge and get it ground in. But also it's kind of light colored. So the other one I really like using is Hershey's Cocoa powder again you can you can put it on wet or dry and just give it like that extra bit of filth and if you don't want to use those natural substances you can always also buy Ben Nye and Mayron they both make uh, powders like plains dust charcoal and ash and again these can be applied wet or dry and in, in the case of these ones these are completely washable and finally, um, if you're doing something like The Walking Dead or something like that, there's stuff called Fresh Scab. You can also buy blood, um, but the problem with blood is that it tends to remain sticky and look wet, whereas Fresh Scab is the type of thing you can actually smear into clothing. And it, the only thing is it usually will stain any light colored clothing, but it'll completely come off of skin. Uh, it's it's, it's non-toxic and is very safe. My next question comes from Raven. She says, great video. In regards to the Q&A, could you possibly do an analysis of costumes as a reflection on the character's influence? So one great example is when Marjorie and Cersei were talking before Tyrion and Sansa's wedding, and you could see a variety of characters imitating one or the other's respective style and color scheme. Uh, Michelle Clapton's actually made a comment about that saying, Marjorie's in great competition with Cersei, which plays out in season three. It's almost like a fashion fight between them, which is quite funny. Cersei's armored corset is to show power, but then Marjorie undermines her with the girlish, revealing simplicity of her new dresses. It's a dangerous game. Sansa, you know, we know that she's been easily influenced by Marjorie. She leaves her kimono style gowns for the most part in favor of a more symmetrical style gown, much more in keeping with Marjorie. And the gowns are not too much of a departure as to not be offensive to Cersei. Like she doesn't really want Cersei to notice too much because that would put her in a bit of jeopardy. But there's because they're still modest, they're long flowing sleeves, but are slightly more fitted on the upper arm. Here is a series of screen grabs that I caught from uh, just before the wedding uh, that Sansa has to Tyrion. So uh, just to show you some of these examples. So uh, in this case, we've got a woman that's walking in front of the two of them, and she's clearly wearing a Cersei style gown, the kimono style gown with the, the metal belt, and even her hairstyle is like Cersei's. Cersei's. Next, on the left, we have two women and it's interesting because one of them is wearing almost an identical Marjorie dress. And on the right, the, woman, the other woman, she's wearing more of a Cersei type dress. This dress here, it's a little bit of a mashup. The cutout upper sleeves are definitely Tyrell, while the hairstyle is Lannister. The one girl is dressed like one of Marjorie's handmaidens, while the other woman in green is wearing a gown similar to Cersei's gown from season one. In this crowd, we have a mixture of looks. It's about 50-50, I'd say. While in season one and two, the majority would have dressed more like Cersei. So we definitely are seeing a change going on here. Uh, we have to give, though, that some of the guests might actually be, you know, invited by the Tyrells. So I wanted to show you this dress. We saw her from behind in the other picture. The color and kimono styling is very much Lannister, but the little cutouts are definitely an influence are definitely influenced by Marjorie's dress in season two when she first arrives in King's Landing. And here's a crowd shot of the mixture of all of the guests. So that wraps up this q and I really had a blast doing it. And if you guys enjoyed it, I will do another one in the near future. And if you like what you see, please like and share my video and don't forget to subscribe to get notified for any of my future videos. And as always, thank you so much for watching.